Welcome to Post Doom, regenerative conversations exploring overshoot grief, grounding, and gratitude. I'm Michael Dowd, your host. And in this conversation, recorded in December, December 23rd, actually, of 2019, I speak with longtime friend and colleague, Steve Behrman, also known as Swami Beyondananda, the cosmic comic. Steve's website is um, wakeuplaughing.com. And I encourage you to check it out. In fact, read the bios for both Steve Behrman and Swami Beyondananda because they're different and overlapping. And very few people bring together deep ecological and evolutionary wisdom and just a wonderful sense of humor as Steve does. I hope you enjoy this conversation. Steve, it's a delight to see you again, brother, and to be yeah, part of this conversation series uh, on post-doom. <laughs> so I, I want to just start off, uh, I don't want to assume that people are familiar with you or that everybody's familiar with you, so say a little bit about yourself and Swami Beyondananda and just sort of what you're known for and particularly interested or passionate about these days. Well, you know, I've been on parallel paths for, for quite a while. Um, in fact, my wife Trudy and I just celebrated our vinyl wedding anniversary, 33 and a third. So we are clearly a long playing couple. And uh, over this 33 and a third uh, year period, uh, we've been traveling around with the, with the traveling Swami and Trudy show. Swami Beyond Ananda is the cosmic comic. Uh, and uh, basically the, the Swami's mission is really to help us um, lighten up and enlighten up uh, in, in serious times and not just to leave people laughing, which is really great, but also to leave them smiling and leave them with a sense of, um, of upliftment and so on. And on the serious side, you and I have, have evolution in common. I wrote a book with uh, Bruce Lipton, cellular biologist called uh, Spontaneous Evolution, Our Positive Future and a Way to Get There from Here. And um, it, uh, that's, that's been the path that I've been traveling, looking at uh, what I'm calling right now, the great upwising as we wake up and wise up to the uh, illusion of separation, we wake up to the illusion of separation, we wise up to the uh, truth of our connectedness. And in reference to the current uh, planetary environmental, uh, the new word is a uh, situation uh, in relation to our situation, uh, a mantra came to me uh, a while back. Uh, we're all in the same boat the Titanic is sinking and the lifeboat is the love boat and the love boat is a lifeboat. So I, I like that. <laughs> that seems to be you know, a foundation for, for our conversation right now. I travel around the country. We just got back from a um, 12 city tour, 9,000 mile drive cruise oh, around wow. the country, taking the pulse of the body politic. And the good news is we still have a pulse. <laughs> <laughs> and that balances off all the repulsion that we're that we're experiencing in, in every way shape and form and uh what i'm finding is that the crisis is what calls forth our our evolution and you know in every life um in every individual life uh they're the point where the, the unworkable is wanting to be worked out and all of those things um end up putting us on a hero's journey. And, and right now, as a species, we are on that hero's journey with the entire species in, in the role of the hero, um, participating in the greatest show on earth. This is the greatest reality show of all time. Reality, it's amazing. So uh, that's pretty much where I'm coming from. Um, really recognizing the seriousness of things and yet, also recognizing that whatever it is that keeps us above the line in a space of uh, love and joy is what will make us most useful to ourselves and everybody else. Yeah, boy, I couldn't agree more with that. In fact, when, Con when I told Connie, we were, out, we were out pretending to be the wind, not pretending, we were personifying the wind. We were being persons doing what the wind has always done, taking redwood seeds that we gathered in Northern California and Southern Oregon, and putting them among the sword ferns, letting them be the wind, because this is where 
uh, the Redwoods are going to need to be in the not too distant future. And they're already that Redwoods and Sequoias that have been planted here in the Pacific Northwest over the last hundred years by various botanical gardens and horticulturalists and things like that. So that's what we were doing. And I told her that I'd be uh, having a conversation with you. And she said, oh, that's great. She said, we need some real humor and anything that, as you said, put a smile on our face and a laugh in our belly and our heart is, uh, is going to be good in challenging times. The levitational pull. Yeah, there you go. Because <laughs> <laughs> gravity is a downer. <laughs> yes, yeah, indeed. Well, and that's one of the things, just, you know, when we saw each other last, I think it was Marin County uh, some years ago now, um, your ability to play with words in just delightful sort of twisting ways uh, to keep a, a smile on my lips, at least, has been really a treat. How do you interpret the phrase, a positive future, in the light of not just climate change, but abrupt climate change, which could potentially mean the end of our species within this century. Well, you know, we wrote the book 10 years ago. And, um, you know, at that point, um, when we were just set to send it to the publisher, uh, Barack Obama had been elected president. I think we all were a bit strung out on hopium. Uh, <laughs> and maybe a bit of deniatol. That's another drug. That, okay? uh, and... Uh, and so we, we wrote this, uh, you know, we, we look at, from that standpoint, it certainly looked as if yes, exactly. we would be moving in the right direction. Right. Um, what I've been saying recently, and I'm doing a program with, with Bruce this Friday and Foster Gamble, who uh, produced oh, this right movie. Yeah, I know Foster. What I'm saying is that uh, when we wrote the book, spontaneous evolution was a, uh, a noun in the future and it's become a verb in the present. And the piece that I would emphasize is the piece that, the reason why we named the book Spontaneous Evolution uh, is because we are looking at the phenomenon of spontaneous remission, which is a temp, I consider spontaneous remission as little as we understand it as a template for miracles. Because what happens is that somebody has an illness a condition that's, that the doctors have said, it's untreatable, go home, get your affairs in order, et cetera, et cetera, prepare to leave the world, and something happens, something, something happens. And Louis Mill Madrona wrote an interesting book called Coyote Medicine, and he had studied a number of people who experienced this spontaneous remission. And he said that the common note in every one of these that he found was, he called it a change of story, a change of story. And so um, we are at the point where the spontaneous remission will only come from a spontaneous remissioning by shifting our uh, conscious mission from um, uh, the me or you world to a me and you world, from survival of the fittest to thrival of the fittingest. And we're at the point now where um, we must be open to miracles. And we also have to be open to this change of story and recognizing that the purpose of crisis is to precipitate evolution. Now, people are at various points in, in their, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure we could look at uh, the, the current climate climate uh, we could certainly look at Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's stages of, uh, of acceptance of dying and so on. And people are at various stages of that. Mm -hmm. However, when I look at young people, when I look at people who are in their teens and 20s and 30s, it, I have to rededicate myself to this spontaneous remissioning. Because, you know, people are, you know, people like us, you know, we've had 60 or more years. Uh, these people are now looking at, uh, at a future or no future at all. So uh, it's not enough for me to say, you know, the ball game's over. Um, I'm going to pack up my stuff and, and go home and um, run out the clock. Um, it's not enough for me to do that. I have to recognize that in this particular case, where um, um, our 
legacy as a, as a so-called civilization. Um, we're, we're leaving it to these young people who have, are looking at the, um, the arc of their lives and, you know, I mean, there, there, I'm sure there are some people who totally buy this whole, the fossil fuel companies going, hey, there's nothing to worry about. There's just nothing to worry about. You know, just keep playing your video games and keep on keeping on and it'll all be okay. And then there are those who, you know, who are in the middle who see that, um, you know, we, we've got a few years, we have a chance, there's something we can do. And then there's others who are just going, WTF. And, um, hey, I won't have to worry about paying off my college loans. There's a good, there's some good news here. I'm sure you can find a pony in the midst of this somewhere. So um, like, like so many other people, um, I'm, I go through a number of different ways of looking at this. We're in California. Uh, today, we were supposed to have our, um, our power uh, shut off to prevent the possibility of fires Mm -hmm. didn't happen. Our neighborhood is uh, not one of those neighborhoods. We missed the other one. We were on tour, but imagine um, trying to live a normal life and then all of a sudden, literally, you're powerless. You're powerless. Mm -hmm. And in this, in this society, what, well, you've got all your, um, your provisions in the freezer. What happens to that? Uh, what happens when, when the local grocery store loses $15,000 worth of food when they don't have the margin to be able to absorb it. And yes. then you begin to multiply disaster upon disaster upon a disaster in this part of the country and that part of the country and this part of the world. And then the, uh, at some point, there's not enough insurance money to pay for all of this. And certainly not enough to pay for going back to where we were. So right now, being the man in the middle, I'm seeing my mission as bringing people spiritually above the line through truth and humor. Um, and sometimes the best way to tell the truth is through humor. Amen. Uh, and I find that when I'm feeling the most despair, if I can come up with something that is twistedly funny, yes. I can lift myself above the line, share it with somebody else, and like loaves and fishes, humor proliferates out there uh, and recreates itself. And uh, so I'm just wondering, how does the language of post-doom work or not work for you? Like, what do you, what do you think of it? I you, love you, the you, idea of post-doom because it, it's, it's ripe for comedy. I mean, first of all, God, I'm so glad we're done with doom. <laughs> God, what a relief. We're in post-doom. Pre-doom pre -doom is kind of like... Um, uh, all of those poor psychics suffering from pre-traumatic stress disorder. <laughs> I feel so bad for them, you know? Um, so so post-doom, it's like, wow, we're on the other side of it. Whew, glad we made it. I'm pinching myself. I seem to still be here post-doom. That's a good sign. You are too. So what a relief. Congratulations. We're on the other side of it. The value of that is that if we look at the, the great ideal, where, where we want to be, Charles Eisenstein calls it the more beautiful world our hearts know is possible. If we look at how do we get there from here, we can't get there from here. <laughs> However, if we look at how do we get here from there, that's a whole other story. So now that we're in post-doom, what a great relief. Let's help other people get to that stage where we are, and in the process of doing that, we may actually shift some of those problems. Like, like you were talking about the, you know, the, the, uh, you know, an economy that's based on, on uh, perpetual growth and what we call progress. And so redefining, uh, my friend Richard Stockton, another great comedian, says, if at first you don't succeed, change your idea of success. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Redefine success. Okay, so um, we can't. Okay, so we're not going to be able to succeed in infinitely growing the economy. However, we can still succeed in growing happiness, in growing the gross national happiness. In other words, more happiness bang 
for the energy buck or fewer bucks and so on. Yeah. And shifting from um, this seemingly unstoppable um, and unchangeable arc of continuing to make things and throw them away and make things and throw them away and perpetually doing um, what doesn't work and hasn't worked, and that's insanity. So what I see in post-doom is I see it, post-doom is our sane asylum. <laughs> that's what we have to do. We have to commit ourselves to a sane asylum. We have to commit ourselves to sanity. And the word sanity is, comes from the same root as health. Okay, so what is health? It's that inner sense of coherence, our heart sense of all is well in here, no matter what it looks like out there. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, if we want to um, really be, uh, you know, create this new world, there's a three-step program, which mathematically works four times faster than 12-step. Yeah. <laughs> we all know that. <laughs> and the step one is inner dependence, inner dependence, which is reconnecting your own, uh, plugging into source, your own source, rather than looking at there's something out there that I need to get that from. And, you know, we are a civilization of hungry ghosts. We're a civilization of uh, people who've learned to look at getting something from somebody, having an agenda. Hi there, what can you do for me? Uh, and that being the subtext of so many yeah. transactions, okay? Well, transactions occur on this transactional level. Nothing really changes. You're simply exchanging energy. You know, you're, uh, you're alleviating a symptom, perhaps. When you want to move to the transformational level, um, then you have to take full responsibility and acknowledge where you are, it, you know, it, it, be aware of what the situation is and where your part, what your part is, acknowledge it and accept it. And at that point, you become independent. You become an independent, mature, um, Swami would call it a uh, soul, um, S-O-U-L, soul proprietor, okay? You're a soul proprietor. And so you, you, you've, you've evolved from a child of God to an adult of good. And you now are ready to be of service. And then the final stage, only then- Wait, 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 wait. Uh, okay, I, I'm writing these down. So the first one is inner- inner, inner dependence. In other words, you actually have, you're hooked into source, okay, whatever that is for you. Uh, what's whatever the second one? Have, yeah. And what's the second one? The second one is independence, where, oh, okay. where you're actually acting as a adult, mature, independent, sole proprietor, S-O-U-L, proprietor mm -hmm. of, your, of your destiny. And finally, having being connected with spirit and being connected with the unique self that you are, you're now ready for interdependence, which is, you know, the community that we've all, that we all know is possible. Uh, and it requires um, evolution. Uh, Swami says that, of course, Jesus believes in evolution. Otherwise, he would have said, now, don't do a thing till I get back. <laughs> so what we're talking about is spiritual evolution yeah. and crisis precipitates spiritual evolution. So anything you'd like to share about you and or yours and Trudy's experience since you've been together for 33 and a third years. And we started, we started out in, in a very, very optimistic way. Um, you know, we, we launched our, our traveling Swami and Trudy show and we saw uh, that this was really a, a wide open, uh, a wide open world and conversation. It was in the, uh, the mid to late 1980s. And we were about uh, several years into um, Reaganism, which really was the, really was the, uh, the way that the, um, the extractor energy allowed itself to take over and begin to convince us that, um, that government, which is something that the Declaration of Independence designed as something that was really for us and something that would empower the people. That something about government was bad and wrong. And so we needed to be wary of it and we'll just let the, the trickle down theory uh, work. And of course, as we have discovered, 
it's called trickle down because the people at the, that's why the people at the bottom are called peons, okay? That's, how, that's where trickle down works, okay? But we were part of that um, as the 60s gave way to the 70s and then the 80s, there was this gradual shift uh, into the me zone. Uh, and, you know, we are, uh, ours is the first fully narcissistic generation in history. Um, it, because we were marketed to as narcissists. We were always marketed to as narcissists. It's, uh, without, and of course, we didn't know that because all we know is, hey, I'm a good person. I'm an individual. It's wonderful to live in a country where individuals have the right to be all that they can be, whether they join the army or not. And so we were part of that wave. And I remember having that feeling of, um, what do they call that? The, the, um, it's always going to get better. It's always going to get better. There's always going to be more. We're always going to make more money next year than we did this year. We're always going to be more prosperous than we were this year. And uh, the first creaks in that uh, started happening uh, with, with the, uh, the dot-com bust. And then we had the bank bust in 2008. And we are now at the point in the USA where about 40% of the people are a paycheck away from eek, right? Which is why they call eking out in existence, right? And so eek, you know, and so um, meanwhile, meanwhile, back in the jungle, we've been trying to live a normal life and trying to somehow normalize these things that are happening to us. So as Trudy and I have had our journey, we've been reviewing the last 20 years where we've been living in California and we're recognizing that um, except for the first few years each year we've been a little less prosperous than the year before we've had to work harder we've had to do more we've had to um, things have become more expensive things have become more challenging fewer you know we do have by the way as you're I'm sure very well aware twice as many people as we had 50 years ago that's got to make a difference. Now, some say, wow, twice as many people to market to. But given, given the, um, the kinds of ways that we have organized ourselves that are obsolete and obsolethal, um, we, are, we are now at the point where the, that no longer applies. So as individuals, we've had to recognize that, that our, um, our, our well-being has been um, compromised. And um, there are so many factors that have been moving us forward. Well, that's okay. We'll just keep moving on, moving on, moving on. And at some point, as we're noticing with the number of people who've moved from California or who have um, moved to uh, other countries in, uh, in South America or elsewhere around the world where um, they're, they are a little bit more advanced than being a third world country. We're just, we're just starting out as a third world country right now. So what we've noticed uh, is that um, in our audiences, that first of all, uh, if, we're, if, we're, if our financial prosperity depends on selling books and that sort of thing, fewer people are buying. Fewer, fewer people have the discretionary income right. to sustain this system. So we've been impacted that way. And we've also been impacted by recognizing the suffering of people who, are, who have had the, the um, fires, floods, other weather situations, droughts that have um, compromised their lives and are looking at, and, and there's a, you know, their, their lives are diminished by that, and yet they're being told that everything is normal. They want to believe that everything is normal. Exactly. At the same time, one of the things that Trudy has been really, really uh, immersed in, and I'm also excited about it, is the possibility of restoring the ecology and renewing the economy through agricultural industrial hemp. And... Um, it's something that grows like a weed. It's something that doesn't require the herbicides and pesticides. It's something that is a renewable resource that can replace the deforestation that's happening. It sequesters carbon. It can replace um, fossil fuels to a certain extent. Uh, they're now using um, 
uh, hemp and hempcrete in building using hemp fiber boards so that we are not using as much plastic and so on. And uh, we, are, we are actually in the process of launching our own project and campaign called Hemp is for Everyone. And it relates to how every aspect of our lives and society can be positively impacted through this trim tab crop. And in the process of doing that, it brings people together around something positive and constructive so that together we're built, we're moving in, in the right idea. You, you probably understand this and you've had this happen in your own life that the way that grace, we've been great, Judy and I have been really talking about grace and what is it that cultivates grace? And we know that grace is bestowed. You can't leverage grace. You can't arm wrestle with God. You know, somebody asked the Swami a while back, Swami, have you ever wrestled with God? Swami says, yes, I did until I realized it's fixed. Right? <laughs> exactly. So that wrestling is for sure fixed. So you, we cultivate grace, I am finding, by gratitude, number one, by having an intention, a, an intention of moving something forward in a purposeful way. And then thirdly, taking action in the direction of that intention. Yeah. So that's what you did. You, you, you came to this conclusion that we're in post-doom, that progress is, uh, the way we've seen it, is, uh, is a non-starter. And we have to actually, again, that's the reality that we have to face. You're obviously grateful for everything that you have. Everything that you do or say, to me, speaks of gratitude. There's a fundamental field of gratitude. Amen. You know, you're not, you're not complaining, you're not suffering, you're simply being grateful for what's been presented as reality so you can do something with it. Yeah. And, and then, of course, you've, you've set your intention to, a, a, in the process of doing the series and in doing the talks that you're doing, you've taken steps to, um, to bring this to the world best you can, mm -hmm. and grace is showing up. You're grace is an amazing word because it's, it, you know, it's a religiously loaded word, but it's so, you know, Connie, my wife, both of us are religious naturalists, as you know, as sacred realists. And so our experience of grace is present in and through life and in and through how people interact with us. Cultivating the eyes of grace, cultivating the eyes of pro noia, cultivating a, an ability like exercising a muscle to find the gift and the blessing in whatever shows up is I think one of the more important skill sets that we can develop these days. Yeah, and, and I think that that's really what, um, uh, if we look at our journey, uh, Trudy and I, we've each become more, this has been a, a journey of spiritual maturing. Yes. Um, much of what was, what was termed the new age movement um, back in the 80s, and again, a lot, of my, uh, a lot of my early shows, that's who I was, you know, and I try to make, you know, poke fun at it. You know, I, I found that the, uh, that the two most, uh, two things that people were most interested in then was making more money and losing weight. So naturally, the Swami wanted to be helpful, came up with a mantra to help people lose weight uh, and have money at the same time. Uh, everything I eat turns to money and my drawers are full of cash. <laughs> so. So we were, we were doing our job and, and just kind of gently flashing the shadow. But what we didn't see is that we were part of that as well. Yeah. And uh, our, our wonderful teacher, Elizabeth Belkar, uh, came up with, uh, she reminded us that there's really four stages of service. One is I serve myself. You know, that's what we're seeing that rampant in, in the White House and that meme right now. The second one is I serve the world, but I'm not taking care of myself, and I'm, I'm bereft and impoverished. Mm -hmm. The third stage is I'm saving the world, and my ego is out in front. Ain't I great? You know, so in other words, it's basically a self-serving uh, self idea in the guise of look at all the good work I'm doing. Yeah. And then the fourth is I'm serving the world, and I'm... And I'm serving myself because I'm part of the world. Yeah. You know, it's like the Buddhist 
may all beings be happy. And what Swami adds to it is, and I am happy being a happy being. And so one of the gifts when I do speak in new thought and new age settings is I say, you know, the heart of that worldview, as far as I'm concerned, isn't that if you have the right beliefs, everything's going to be fine and dandy for you. I understand the heart of that worldview that if you have a mindset that's aligned with reality and committed to looking for the good, you can thrive in any setting, in any context, in any environment. And not just thrive individually, but you can help others thrive because that's where we get our greatest joy in being assistance to others. And that, that is a fabulous reframe. That's a fabulous reframe because in a certain regard, that's really, um, you know, the thing that we, have, that we have control over, more or less, is how we respond to things. Yeah. That's the area where we're given control. You know, somebody once asked the Swami, do we create our own reality? And Swami says, well, we used to, but now it's mostly made in China. We need, so, we need to have those little things, you know, and committing random acts of comedy, committing random, I call it committing random acts of comedy, yeah. little bits of darshan that you can do. Um, and Trudy and I do that when we're on the road, we do that with people. Uh, we were just in uh, visiting uh, my relatives in, on the East Coast and we went out to dinner with my brother and we come back to, we're staying with my cousins. He asked Trudy, what'd you have for dinner? Trudy said, I had duck. And he said, how did they prepare the duck? And we looked at each other and we said, you know, you can't really prepare a duck for something like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, just those little things. I mean, yeah. this is the thing, humor, joy, laughter. I mean, that's one of the things that marks our species because language allows that to happen. The little, little turns at the end that you just go, wow, that's cool. And you said that about language. You said that right at the outset. Yes. That the philosophy of language, because language creates expectation, humor turns a corner and dashes the expectation and we laugh and surprise and delight because the mind has been tricked into a new way of, yeah. into novelty, into yeah. a new way of viewing something. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Solutions well, come out of that. And it may be that from a joke, uh, something that really transforms this time, these times. And at least for some people where there's, um, where, um, there's a way that they're thriving, that they didn't know they could, because of a joke, because of something that disrupted the ordinary and presented a new possibility. It's the joy of dancing and, and music and any kind of arts and humor is, uh, is going to allow us to thrive in difficult uh, contracting times. So, You know, the thing about cello, of course, the Swami would say there's always room for cello, but the thing about cello is it's an instrument that paces the heart. That's where that vibration is. If you think about that mellow string, you know, it's not the violins up here, not the bass down here. It's in that, in that heart space. And I remember here locally in, uh, in the Bay Area, hearing an artist do Eleanor Rigby on cello. And it was the most moving, moving piece. All yeah, well, and that song came through with the cello. Yeah, uh, well, the, the song that the, that the person sent to me, gosh, I wish I remember the name uh, to honor him in this moment, but um, it was Hallelujah. It was uh, Leonard Cohen's Hallelujah. And, um, and I was just mesmerized. It was like, it was so beautifully done and it was so heartful. And then when I started listening and watching the other ones, the, these two guys, they do they do stuff with the cello that I didn't know was possible to do with the cello. I mean, they do stuff that's like violin. I mean, it's, it's amazing. Anyway, two cellos, highly recommend it. It's well, awesome. check it out. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. This is one of the questions I've been asking all my guests is to, if they have anything to say about our inborn human strengths and limitations. Um, well, you know, I'm, I'm much more interested in human nurture in, in the sense that uh, I, I read years ago, they discovered the violence gene. There is a violence gene that some people have. And then when you read the finer print, it takes violence to activate the violence gene. So um, it won't be activated if you're not in a violent situation. And yet those people that want to create, uh, want to take us out of the picture and make this uh, 
uh, a, a purely biological conversation. Oh yes, we're, we're, we're innately uh, susceptible to violence and so on. We've been living under the rule of the lowest common denominator for thousands of years. And it's in our DNA, it's in our DNA memory and so on. And so this is a time where we have to give ourselves uh, the opportunity, first of all, to acknowledge that um, and not blame ourselves, but simply recognize the need for, for reprogramming. So I think that, you know, somebody says, well, are, are human beings good or bad? The answer is absolutely. How to stay joyful and um, engaged uh, in the midst of what is unavoidable, namely, this is the world we're living in right now. You know, uh, I grew up, I grew up in New York and yeah. we had that when I was a kid. If you're in the subway in New York, you didn't look at anybody. Right because that was how people kept their private space. Exactly. You look at somebody, it was like, hey, what are you looking at? So everybody would be behind. That's why the New York Times was such a big paper. Some of the poor people had the New York Daily News, the smaller paper that they had to put up in front of them so that they didn't engage with people. And so that was my early example of how this population pressure works. The bonobos, you know, the, the, the chimps that actually make love, not war, they live in an environment where there's abundant food, as you said. Uh, so when there is that, um, when resources are, um, are shared and abundant, and, and, and I would say that, uh, as my friend Timothy Nobles, who has a book coming out called More Than Enough, as he says, we have more than enough. It's simply our ways of distributing and the way that we've applied our resources using so much of it to fight one another. Yeah. So in, a, in, in redesigning how we've organized our resources, all of a sudden we are more resourceful. There really are more resources. When we stop making things that are gonna fall apart, when we stop making things uh, that are designed to um, enrich people uh, because of fear, you know, then we have an opportunity. And I see the crisis that we're in right now is the opportunity to abandon this, um, uh, this industrial mindless production of um, calling economic growth the growth in physical things when actually it's the, the real growth is in the intangibles that allow us to use the physical things more efficiently and lovingly. Well, you know, Steve, one of the things I want to ask you is what has inspired you over the years? Like, like who have been the teachers or the books or the whatever it is that you and Trudy have found most helpful, most inspiring, um, sort of soul brothers and sisters on the path? Any resources that you would be willing to share that you two have found helpful or inspiring? I'm sure that would be useful to others. Wow. Well, that's interesting. Um a number of things come to mind. I think right at the beginning, actually, even our wedding vows, we quoted Barbara Marks Hubbard because she was really looking at um, people using their creativity in an evolutionary way. And we saw our entire 33 and a third year journey has really been about being in service of, uh, of this idea of human evolution, love and, and development. A very, very important book for both of us was Glenda Green's book, Love Without End. And this is, um, she's a painter. This is her experience um, channeling Jesus. And um, ha having grown up in a Jewish family, I didn't really, um, you, know, I, you know, Jesus wasn't that attractive to me. But when we read this book and when we heard her tapes, um, it really brought it out in such a universal way. Um, every time there'd be a chance to go to contraction, he would go to expansion. And there was such a fundamental truth about this um, that it inspired us and in that, you know, we first, um, in fact, I performed at her, um, her book uh, launch 20 years ago, 21 years ago now. And um, so for that 21 years, we've had the light of this book shining on us and shining through us. Called uh, Love Without End. Love Without End by Glenda Green. Okay, great. Uh, very powerful book. 
we've also, um, we, you know, I personally, um, two of the heroes that I've had, neither of whom I actually ever met, uh, Milton Erickson and Bucky Fuller. Oh my gosh. And Milton Erickson is the father of modern hypnotherapy. Not only do I know who Milton Erickson is, I'm a trained Ericksonian hypnotherapist. There you go. <laughs> I've never used it much, but uh, I was trained in the late 1980s. I did uh, several years of neurolinguistic programming training, NLP, which of course John Grinder and yeah. Richard Bandler had modeled uh, yeah. Virginia Satir and Gregory Bateson and uh, and, uh, and uh, Fritz uh, Perls. Milton Erickson and Fritz Perls, right, exactly. And so then I learned uh, uh, Ericksonian hypnotherapy, and it's rare that I have a conversation with somebody who knows about him. So this is great to hear. Please continue. He was a reframe. He was the master of the reframe. And my favorite Erickson story that applies right now, uh, when he's doing his residency, there was one of the patients at this mental institution, because he was a psychiatrist, who had delusions of being Jesus Christ. What does Erickson do? He comes up to him with all of these carpentry tools. He says, I understand you have experience as a carpenter. Well, the guy had to become a carpenter. He had to. Because in rather than contradicting the delusion, yes. Erickson made a big circle around the delusion and created a functional way for this guy to have the delusion and, and right. be functional. Right. We need to do the same thing right now with all of the various, I mean, I see that every religion is a delusional system. It's a delusional system. It's a belief system. Yes. And uh, as my friend Jacob Lieberman pointed out a few weeks ago, when you look uh, at in a thesaurus, the opposite of belief is truth. The antonym for belief is truth. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? That right? is very interesting. Yeah. So, so what we need to do right now is rather than contradict people's beliefs, we need to find the pathways that allow those beliefs to find their most functional and loving um, applications. Yes. Yeah, and because when you're, you know, you know, you're pushing against something, you actually strengthen it. You know, Donald Trump has been practicing isometrics. He's good at isometrics. The more people push against him, the stronger he, he becomes. But you ignore him and, there, and he's, he's zero because he has no fundamental substance. He's just, you know, somebody who is, uh, you know, there's nothing that he's really for in, in that regard. He's the absence of love in, in, in personification. So love doesn't push against the absence of love. Love just is. Mm -hmm. And so that really would, if we were to mature and overgrow that, we would be gathering around uh, the greatest um, applications and uh, expressions of love to such an extent that we disempower the sociopathogens who've been feeding on it, on us and feeding on the fear. Any, anything else do you want to say about Milton Erickson? And then there was somebody else you mentioned. Okay. Milton er so I, I want to say that when I think of Milton Erickson, I think of influencing with integrity. He had the ability to get inside of people's heads, literally get inside of people's heads. And while he was there in all of the evidence I've read, you know, my voice will go with you. I read Jay Haley's book on uncommon therapy, many stories about Milton Erickson. In every one of those cases, he was inside their head to empower the people, to empower them, to make them more self-sufficient, to make them more whole, not looking to get anything from them, not looking to manipulate them for his own benefit. Yes, exactly. So that's why. And then, of course, Bucky Fuller, um, I love his concept of the world game, uh, which, which is um, actually he, he designed the world game 50 or more years ago and had people play it. And the idea behind it is cooperation, collaboration, and competition in the original Greek meaning of competition, which meant to strive together. Mm -hmm. Family that strives together, thrives together. So the, the Greek athletes were not trying to beat the other guy they were simply using one another as their pace cars to achieve their personal best, striving together. And so, uh, you know, Bucky Fuller wrote a book 50 years ago called Utopia or Oblivion. And that was, that's our choice. That's our choice. If we're not willing to embrace the possibility of heaven on earth, then we're going to go in the other direction.
So I wondered if, if there's anything else that you want to say about any of the influences or inspirations for you along the way. And then is there any way that evolution itself, I mean, given that, you know, you and Bruce wrote this book on spontaneous evolution, anything about evolution and the history of everyone and everything like big history or the universe yeah. story or the epic of evolution or what Connie and I, our main website is the great story. Anything about how that has been helpful or inspiring to you along the way? You know, what's really been helpful about, about evolution is recognizing that, that it only goes in one direction. It, uh, I mean, there's been devolution, of course. I mean, you know, there, there are species that don't make it and so on. But as you pointed out earlier, life continues. Life continues. Life continues. And so part of where we are right now is we are, um, I like to, to look at, uh, you've probably seen demonstrations of cymatics. Um, cymatics is um, how sound interacts with physical matter. So let's say you have a speaker and you put iron filings on the speaker. When you play a, uh, a certain frequency, the iron filings arrange themselves in a sacred geometry pattern. When you turn it to a higher frequency, then you have a sacred geometry pattern that is more intricate and more beautiful, and more complex, on and on. When you're moving the dial from one frequency to the next, however, it's chaos. All the particles are in motion. All the particles are in motion. So if we want to stay sane about where we are right now, it, if we do believe in evolution, if we do believe that there is some other order that is emerging, and maybe it's conscious cockroaches, I don't know what that is, but if we believe that there's some other order that is emerging, it only can emerge from chaos. It can emerge from something that's static. So nothing is static. And so when I think of the process of evolution, I think of it in two ways. First of all, it is uh, the continual emergence of life. And uh, the presentation that I'm doing on Friday with uh, Bruce Lipton uh, and Foster Gamble, who uh, produced the Thrive movie, um, it's also pointing to the work of Arthur Young. And Arthur Young was a, um, invented the Bell helicopter, but also was a philosopher of science. And his, the simple way to talk about his philosophy of science was, it's about how light descends into matter and how matter ascends into light. And so uh, matter descend, light descends into matter, you know, light is infinite, et cetera, et cetera. And then you, know, you have these subatomic particles, atoms, molecules, and then from the molecule, we have life that begins. And finally, we have this consciousness that is able to ascend into light, that is able to comprehend light and so on. So Arthur Young sees that as the arc of evolution and that life always has purpose. So when I'm looking at what purposeful evolution is, it, to me, purposeful evolution is the unfoldment of everything, the unfoldment of everything um, that already exists and yet is not yet manifest. And so evolution is the manifest of the unmanifest. So if you, like in, in um, Thank God for Evolution, you're saying, hey, actually, God did create all these things, and um, the creation is manifest on the unfold, the creation is manifest in an unfolding way. The creation is here it is, here it is, here it is. And and so that to me is the on it's reverence for the ongoing, the ongoingness of everything. And I would like to think that there is also the in, in our human species, you know, call me a hopeless hopium addict, but I I believe in the human potential movement. I believe we have the potential to be human. Um, that in this unfolding, there is a spiritual evolution. And regardless of what physically happens to our species, we still have the opportunity to spiritually evolve so that, you know, whether we're, we're birthing a new era or hospicing our species, we're still in that space of love. Yeah. The lifeboat is the love boat and the love boat is the lifeboat. The Greek definition of hubris is the overweening pride of the doomed. 
of the what? The doomed? The doomed. The overweening oh pride God. of the doomed. Oh, my goodness. Well, here, and, here we are. And, Thank God we're post-doom. We don't have Yes, have exactly. Exactly. And so really post-doom is when we realize that humility is our way home. Humility is that path of saying, no, we are not the masters of nature. We are the lovers of nature, the servants of nature, that nature is our larger self, our larger body. And what we do to ourself, we do to ourself at, at all scales. So I like the way that you phrased that. And I really like, the, I like that hum, humus and humility and humiliation also related are human and humor. Yes, exactly. So humor is a way to avoid humiliation by allowing humility through laughter. We lovingly laugh in our own face, self-facing laughter. That's what, that's what that is. So anything you want to say about either death and impermanence or a sort of remaining opportunities of, of well, what's still possible? Uh, apparently death is permanent. I uh, know, but <laughs> actually, uh, <laughs> you know, um, years ago, uh, I... Um, studied with Leonard Orr, the founder of rebirthing, and Leonard Orr was dead set on immortality. And that was his goal, and the people who followed him um, believed in physical immortality. And so a couple of months ago, Leonard passed, you know, at, at the age of, I think he might have been 80, and Leonard passed. And, you know, my, my way of looking at it was, well, he has taken his never-ending quest for immortality to the next Exactly. I've, I've got a bet with somebody. I think it's actually with Andrew, Andrew Cohen. I've got a, a hundred dollar bet that I will outlive Ray Kurzweil. <laughs> <laughs> well, that would be great. Yeah. Well, when he dies, you get your hundred bucks. That's great. Although, although otherwise, uh, Andrew is going to have to collect from, from Kurzweil. If yeah, you right. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then the other, the other question is what areas can we make a difference? And, here we are in uh, California, in the land of uh, PG&E, where uh, power is centralized. And the decentralization of power, the decentralization of our economy, will give us the diversity so that some communities will, will thrive. Um, in, in spontaneous evolution, Bruce and I uh, uh, talk about the intelligence of bacteria. And uh, in this one experiment that was done uh, about 30 years ago, um, bacteria were put into, that, that lacked a certain gene that would enable them to metabolize lactose, were put into a field of lactose. And they went into this immediate um, um, mutation, like rapid mutation, kind of like you and I would be doing a brainstorm. Okay, we have a problem, let's do a brainstorm. And so it's like rapid brainstorming, and uh, the mutation uh, um, purpose of the mutation was to uh, create the gene that will allow them to metabolize that. And sure enough, while many of these bacteria died, there were many of them, the majority of them actually mutated to the point where they had this gene and then that became part of their microbiome. So we are now in that particular phase. You put it a different way earlier in talking about how um, we are you know, trying many different things during, during this time. You know, when you, when you look at, um, okay, here's, the, here's reality, what's possible? So in the question, here's reality, what's possible? In the, in the question, what's possible? All kinds of opportunities can come up where various colonies of bacteria or humans can create mutations or changes that allow the adaptation that will allow them to coexist in that environment. Thrival of the fittingest. My, my, my prescription of cosmic comic consciousness, it's really, again, four, four simple steps. And, and this is a way of looking at the world, not, in a, not as a form of denial, but it's a form of radical acceptance. And step one is the mantra, it's a joke, laugh. Because if you're able to get to that, you have a degree of separation from your own suffering. Mm. Part two, lovingly laugh in your own face. Because what you're laughing, you're laughing in the face of your ego. You're cultivating humility and avoiding humiliation. Yes. Step three, 
go deeper, find the joke hidden in the picture. In other words, when we look for that little contradiction that we haven't seen, an entire uh, evolution can turn on that. You can have a, a revelation and an epiphany that is disguised as a joke, but really liberates a, liberates a contradiction and brings it to consciousness. We call it pumping ironies. You're pumping ironies. You're bringing something ironic to consciousness. And then finally, commit random acts of comedy. Commit random acts of comedy that hurt nobody, that create laughter, that bring people into, uh, into communion by laughing together because it certainly beats crying separately.